Joined now by CNN royal commentator Emily Nash, who just attended the Queen's State funeral, of course, along with uh, Richard and Christiane here with me. And Emily, so we, we watched, we could hear. You were inside those doors. What did you see? I mean, it was quite an extraordinary experience for me. Um, in 20 years as a journalist, I don't think I've ever felt anything like that. Um, world leaders, foreign royals, uh, dignitaries from this country and across the globe gathered, but also with ordinary people who are being, uh, who are present because they've been honoured by the Queen uh, over the last year of her life. And I think what was amazing about it was that everyone was unified and came together and, and fell silent for her. There was absolute silence when the last post was sounded, um, both inside and out. And that's really extraordinary mm. in a congregation of 2,000 people. Um, just every moment of it was exceptionally special. What was it like? I know it's got to be hard to describe, but to be in Westminster Abbey with more than 2,000 people and then to have utter silence descend. It was, you know, spine tingling, I think is the word I would use. And certainly the moment uh, the coffin was brought in, we had this extraordinary music, the sentences from the choir soaring through the Abbey. And I just felt complete goosebumps, you know, um, seeing the coffin borne there to the front on the catafalque in the place where the Queen was crowned and where she was married. Um, just was, uh, you know, it's going to take me a little while to, pro to process my, my thoughts about this all, um, but it was a, a, a huge privilege to have been present. You know, Christiane and Richard and I were talking about the Archbishop's comments, Archbishop Welby, about the Queen, and that he seemed to capture so beautifully what we've heard so much about. He, he described her as joyful and then present for so many. Mm. And, 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 and it seems that, that that's what you felt. You talk about, obviously, they were the dignitaries and the princes and the princesses from so many countries in, in that abbey, but also the regular people Absolutely. who she had honored. And it was, you know, and I was thinking about this as well, the, the, the coffin there with the royal standard, with the scepter and the orb and uh, the imperial state crown, you know, everyone could see that from wherever they were at some point during that service. It was very much like the Queen during her lifetime. You know, people just had to catch a glimpse of her and it touched them. It was something they would remember for the rest of their lives. And I think we've seen that again today. And you can see it now in the crowds of people outlining, you know, the highway to see just a glimpse of it going past. She meant so much to so many people. Mm. And the fact that you had the whole world gather there to pay their respects today just sums it all up. We, we were saying that in, in the UK, in a, in a normal year, there are two or three state visits. There yeah. were hundreds of state visits in just days and just hours, all gathered together. And, and as you watch that procession in the Abbey, um, what was the emotion, emotion like? And you saw you saw King Charles all the way down to Prince George, uh, the nine-year-old son of Kate and William. Did you see the the, the emotions on their faces? I, I think their composure was remarkable. I think um, the children in particular are extremely well behaved. I thought that it was a very difficult moment for all of them, particularly as they were walking in procession behind the coffin. Um, it must have taken great courage to do that. As we've, we've seen them on display over the course of the last 10 days, and um, they have managed to contain their emotions uh, exceptionally well. Um, but nevertheless, it, it appears to have been very difficult. I thought particularly the king, as God Save the King, rang out around the abbey. Yes, it was what a did, huge what, moment for him. Did, what, was, what was watching his face? How did he... Could you see any of his internal emotions as they played that at that moment? He, he just looked incredibly pensive, very solemn. And, and I'm sure he was just thinking, you know, my goodness, he's, he has sat in that place so many times over the years and sung God Save the Queen to mm. his mother and suddenly... The congregation is singing it for him, and she is no longer there. And that is a huge moment in his life. It's a moment, Aunt Richard, that when he realized. Obviously, you know, there's, there's, there's the exhaustion and the process, and they've known this was going to happen, but then it happens, and there are still moments as a human being, right? And that is what I think many of us are still coming to terms with as, as, as British and uh, citizens here. That, that moment we knew she was... It couldn't last forever, but now, oh, it's happened. And, and to, to your point about the king, he, he summed it up, the weight of history. That fell. It's worth remembering. It's obvious, I know, but it's worth remembering that these people, 15, 20 deep, watching this procession, they're there voluntarily. They're there because they've made an individual decision. You know, in some countries where you bust them in, there was no need to hear. 
by the hundreds of thousands people are on the street by their choice. Richard, you said something a few moments ago when we, we weren't, uh, you know, on air, but you said that had you not been working, oh. you would have been there. Oh, it's not an if or, uh, an if or a possibility, it's a, it's a when. If I had not been working this week, uh, I would absolutely have slept on the streets, as I did for the wedding of Charles and Diana, for Diana's funeral, but since then I've been working on these royal events, but no question about it. For me, it would have been mm -hmm. the only place to be. The only place to be, uh, just uh, uh, the beloved figure. As well, you look, think back a, on your memories, you think about the Queen. Yeah, it's history. This is part of history. That's why so many people have come together in this moment of community, unity, and for a few days to rise above the fray and to, you know, have this amazing outpouring. They're traveling west of London now on a road that would normally take to the airport but then leads on to Windsor just to situate where, where the motorcade is. Um, but, you know, one thing we learned, didn't we, Erin, um, that the Piper at the end of the funeral. Oh, this is lovely. At yeah. the end of the funeral mass inside inside the abbey was the same piper who woke her up every morning at 7:15. We're told playing the pipes under her window for some 15 minutes. I think that's a remarkable thing. And then I think, as, as Kate Williams alluded to, this queen once said to her people and to her troops, "I am not the kind of of monarch who can." direct you into war or pass legislation, but what I can give you is my love and my service. And, and it, you know, she's going to be buried in St. George's Chapel, where we've just heard Henry VIII is buried. His daughter became the first great Elizabethan, who once famously said when she was seeing off her troops into battle, you know, I may have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England at that. And it's, it's remarkable that this second Elizabeth mm -hmm. was able in some way to also have that power just by the majesty and the and the, mm -hmm. the unity that she brought even though it's not governing power it, and Christian you also as I, I mentioned briefly but tell us about meeting the Queen well, look, I mean, moment. you know, I was very, very, very proud to have been honored by, by the Queen. Um, the government sets, you know, draws up a list for who are going to get what's called Queen's Honors. And um, I got mine for services to journalism, and it remains, uh, you know, a, a, a source of great pride. And she was wonderful, and I thanked her at the time for that, but also for opening the CNN office here in London. So here's the thing, just to say that yes. just about everybody, as Emily has said and others have said, have a moment, whether it's us, yeah. whether it's the royal family, the dignitaries, or all the people who met her on her walkabouts, on her openings of, you know, roads and right, hospitals she was, and churches. She, she was... And, Schools, T yes. Touchable yes. in that yes. sense yes. to the, to yeah. the average and person. And people feel that they knew her. So. And they kind of did because it was 70 years, especially the Christmas broadcast. I mean, that was a mm. tangible thing. That we, well, even in the U.S., of course, we saw that every year. So but, one of the things that you talked about is this ability of her to just be ordinary with you. Mm. And when I met her, when she opened the uh, CNN office in London, we were terribly worried. Would she go up the stairs or would she take a ramp? to get into the studio. There she is. Absolutely. And uh, she was, so what she's talking about there, she's asking me, what about my earpiece? Really? Yes. She was fascinated that we were able to talk and listen at the same time. And she was quite, she, she had that, that, I've heard it said a million times, she had that ability to make you feel you were just the person you were, she was hoping to meet. It's well, that's a gift it, that course, so few it, human beings have. Absolutely. And then the other time I, I saw her, I only saw her hand. I was covering Mikhail Gorbachev's visit to Windsor Castle. I was a young junior radio reporter. For another, and I stayed later than I should have done because I was doing a last report. And I was in the attic and I walked downstairs. I thought, I'll have a quick look round. And then I suddenly realised in front of me there was a footman, a butler holding a tray with a glass and out came the hand and they could hear the Queen's voice saying thank you and I just backed off quickly before I got arrested. <laughs>